pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to a fellow Scotsman, Roderick McFarquhar, probably mispronounced. Um, Roderick, I was asked first, when and where were you born? I was born in Lahore, which was then part of India. Uh, I was the first baby born in the Lady Willingdon Hospital, as it was called after the Vice Reen, and that was in 1930. And I was told later by my father that uh, when my mother's second sister came in with my father to view the baby, uh, she said, well, if that's babies, I'll have dogs. <laughs> my father didn't speak to her for months. <laughs> But I wasn't aware of all this, uh, so I grew up uh, uh, pretty well most of the first eight years of my life were spent um, in India and mainly in Amritsar and um, uh, then I went back to prep school. So let's go back a few generations um, or one or two to your antecedents. I know your father was a distinguished civil servant in India. and. You may want to go back to the McFarquhar's of McFarquhar or back some generations. Well, the McFarquhar's, uh, I really don't know much about them. I want to find out more. Uh, I was once t told and was taken to uh, the Black Isle, which is neither an island nor black, it's very green, near Inverness. My grandfather and grandmother, my father's parents, were in Inverness. That was where he was born. Um, but apparently, originally the family came from the Black Isle. Uh, according to my father, his grandfather signed his father's, my father's father's birth certificate with an X. So obviously not very well educated, Highland to stock, fought on Bonnie Prince Charlie's side at the Battle of Bannockburn, the names are there. Um, I said the Battle of Bannockburn. I don't mean the Battle of Bannockburn. I mean the Battle of Culloden. Culloden, of course. Mm. Um, how natural to think of a victory rather than a defeat. <laughs> um, and uh, my father was the oldest of the five surviving children of my grandmother. Uh, he was the first and indeed the last to go to a university. I went to Aberdeen University, went up through the Scottish system, which as you know is a good system, uh, totally by scholarship, because my, my grandfather was a, you know, worked in a tailor's shop and was not particularly rich. Um, and I once asked my father, years later of course, uh, what made you, a person who had never been outside Scotland, uh, decide to apply to join the Indian Civil Service? And he said, well, the pension seemed good. <laughs> um, and of course, the British government being as mean as it always is with its servants, uh, that pension remained the same from when my father joined the service in the late 20s to the mid 50s. And uh, when the ICS alumni, so to speak, uh, led a revolt and they finally forced the government to up it. What about your grandmother? My Scottish grandmother I saw quite a bit of because uh, when my parents were both in India and I was going to, uh, to Fetis, uh, they, uh, I spent holidays with her in Inverness. And she was a very small Scottish lady with a very grey hair and bun, mm. uh, but was very oddly modernised and knowledgeable about the films. She used to get a film magazine every week and she knew about all the marriages and all the parts they played, totally un unlike what you would expect. Uh, eventually she had to leave Inverness, she couldn't look after herself, and the one, the one girl in the family, one uh, of the, my father's siblings, uh, who had moved down to, um, to Erith in Kent, uh, she was a draftswoman and had a good job down there. She was deputed to look after my grandmother, which she did. Um, but the only other person who I think might have gone to university had things somehow turned out differently was my father's uh, 
third brother uh, who uh, had a quite distinguished career in the sense that, uh, or, or extraordinary career in the sense that he um, uh, he fought in the Spanish Civil War. He, he didn't fight. He was an ambulance person on the Republican side, of course. Um, he had been a communist briefly when he was uh, younger, uh, but his faith in communism, whatever he had, disappeared. Uh, I think partly because of the communists he met in Spain, partly because of events in Britain. And um, he later became, he fought in the war, became the captain, uh, later became secretary of the Highland Fund, which was designed to put, encourage uh, urban dwellers in Scotland to go back to the crofts. And it was a system of trying to revive the crofting system in Weest and so on. Um, which was, I think, sort of successful, but he became he became a, a, quite a left-wing Labour uh, supporter. Uh, I was a right-wing Labour supporter, <laughs> and uh, on one famous occasion, I, he being left-wing was anti-Europe, I being right-wing was pro-Europe. Um, one famous occasion, a a story appeared in the. Um, in the uh, Times that Roderick McFarker had signed, no, what the story was an advertisement, that's right. Uh, Roderick McFarker had signed an advertisement which was anti-Europe. And my then wife, late wife, uh, Emily, uh, said, you know, you should call up your friends and say something about this because they'll all think you've, you've gone traitorous. <laughs> and I said, no, I've been in this European movement for so long, no one will believe that. About an hour later, the first phone call came saying, <laughs> uh, had I changed my colours? And so I had to plant an item in the Times Diary, will the, which is entitled, will the, will the real Roderick McFarker please stand up? <laughs> which distinguished between us. We were very good friends. Mm. He used to come down uh, from Scotland to be on a CND march. He would bring a bottle of Talisker or Glenlivet and I never drink whiskey, but by the end of the weekend, it was half gone, <laughs> and we were very good friends, and I, I loved him dearly, uh, and I still have a actually a, a fine portrait that was done of him. Let's go back then. Well, tell me something about the character of your parents, and how you think that might have influenced you. Well, I think that the, my father's influence, I suspect, from what... Uh, my kids have said what my late wife said um, was probably in, in the realm of work in the sense that he worked very hard um, as I grew up uh, he got of course increasing responsibility uh, he was deputy commissioner Amritsar which was a very important job in the Punjab and his last four years in Amritsar, he was the uh, settlement officer, which means he did the last cadastral survey and land assignment in the whole of British India. Hmm. Um, and he worked very hard at it. Uh, my part in it was simply um, uh, riding around occasionally to the various villages which were within his purview. And we would be greeted, of course, uh, with uh, garlands. And uh, my my greatest memory is of uh, one village which had gone out of its way and there was a great big arch which said welcome Mr. McFarker and then there was another arch welcome Mrs. McFarker and then the third arch welcome young Prince McFarker <laughs> <laughs> that really made me love those villagers and we would stay you know at what mm. dark bungalows are mm. we used to stay at those um, and it was really when you think of it it was an incredible life uh, the people would come out sort of in their late 20s and be running areas with thousands and tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of people living in it. Enormous responsibility and it's incredible that at the end of the British Empire in India there were only 1,200 Indian civil servants of whom 600 were Indian. Um, so I, I was obviously very impressed by this job. I remember when my father moved from the Punjab to central government, 
1940, I think. Uh, and I remember once during the Quit India campaign run by the Congress Party, uh, we were bicycling home from somewhere and um, uh, there were some Quit India notices on the, uh, on the, um, on the walls that lead up to the Vice Regal Lodge and we stopped and tore them off and I thought, you know, that's what one did in, <laughs> if one was, British, uh, one was a British person in India. And I remember also at school, I went to a Christian brother's school, not because my parents were Catholic, but because they thought that was the best education available in, in Delhi. And there were Hindus and Muslims, of course, and every religion. Um, and I remember one Hindu boy saying to me, well, the Japanese were at the gates at that time, I think that uh, you're, you're going to lose this war. And I said, no, we're not. And uh, I, there was no way I could believe that the British would lose. No way. Because that's what the confidence that you had when you ran a place the like war India. being independence war. No, I'm talking about uh, the World War II. Ah, oh, right. No, no, I'm talking about World War II, that mm -hmm. the Japanese were at the gates. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it seemed like I had been evacuated from my school in Scotland uh, to avoid German invasion in Britain mm. and I came and there was possibly going to be a Japanese invasion of India mm. and but I just I, it didn't even occur to me to consider it as a possibility that we could lose and thank, thank God we didn't um, so I think my father's work habits probably mm. uh, had an effect work was most important mm. um, my mother was brought up in India. She was born in Calcutta. My kids... What, what, what was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Whitburn. Mm. And um, my, her father had been a ship's engineer who uh, came on to Calcutta and uh, presumably left the merchant marine and became an engineer, a civil engineer in, in Bengal at that time. Um, uh, my mother was born in Calcutta and um, like myself later, it was sent home to school. Uh, she wanted to be, she had a wonderful voice, absolutely wonderful voice, and she wanted to be an opera singer, but my grandfather insisted that she come back and be part of the Indian scene and get married and do what everyone else did. And so uh, her career as an opera singer never transpired, though she did sing for Ensa during the war. Uh, it went round giving concerts to troops. Um, she did not work in the sense that modern women work. Uh, she was a brilliant hostess. Um, and um, despite the fact that in India, as you know, uh, the British women did not normally go into the kitchen. There was a uh, Kansama for that. Um, she was a brilliant cook and she cooked not merely curries but all sorts of things uh, for friends and family when she got back to Britain. It wasn't that uh, it never atrophied her ability to cook. Um, so she was a brilliant hostess. One thing my kids want me to find out however uh, is whether or not there's any Indian blood in her line of the family because unquestionably there was a half-sister of my grandmother who was also born in Calcutta uh, who was clearly Anglo-Indian mm -hmm. and my grandmother didn't look at it at all but that other side of the family did and so sometime when I get round it I shall have my DNA checked and see what what my yes, kids. We'll do it together. I need to do that too because I, my children and everyone else thinks the same thing. Really? Either Burmese or Indian or Jamaican, maybe. Could be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're you're pulling rank. Three possibilities <laughs> to buy one. <laughs> ah yes, always one better. Um, what is your first memory as a child or infant? Um, 
concrete memory, not just sort of leaves swaying above your pram, but some particular memory? First memory, yes, that's... We used to go to and fro on the Italian line between uh, India and England, but um, and there are lots of pictures of me as a toddler on these Italian boats, the Conte Verde, uh, Conte Rosso, but I have no memories of that at all. Um, I think, I'm sure, Many of your interviewees have had earlier and much more glamorous memories. I think one of my first memories actually was an Indian memory. Um, and that is that um, when I was five, I, my mother had another child, another boy uh, called David. And uh, he died, I think, either at one or just under one in Kashmir and Srinagar. And um, my grandmother, the one born in Calcutta, and my mother uh, said that um, uh, I was kept asking, where's David? Where's David? And one day they claimed I said, look at the curtain, there's an angel there, look, 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 look. And of course there was nothing there, they said, but I never asked about him again. Uh, that's one of my earliest memories uh, from India. Uh, but these are, these are rel I was then five, and my other memories I think are sort of six or seven, so maybe not so interesting. At what age did you... Well, you said you kept coming back, but uh, when did you come back? At what age, um, sort of permanently, for education in England? Well, the um, as you, I don't know if they did it in your father's service, but um, the, in those days, because of sea voyages took so long, the ICS, uh, after so many years, got eight months leave, home leave. Yeah, and um, in nineteen. What year was the coronation? 37, George VI? Mm -hmm. In 1937, um, uh, we took eight months leave and we went round the world. We went to Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, China, Japan, America. And I, what I, one memory I have, I have a couple of memories from that uh, trip. And that was... Um, First was that uh, the, a slaughterhouse in Chicago, which was absolutely terrible, um, blood sort of dripping mm, from the machinery. Films. Mm. Um, and the other was nearly getting uh, getting left on the subway in New York. <laughs> uh, I was sitting there. My parents were sitting beside me. I was looking out the window. Uh, looked back. Somehow they disappeared. So I had to get up, rush out, and find them. Um, on that trip, I remember I had a fight with a Japanese boy on the Chichibu Maru, which is the ship we sailed from uh, Yokohama to uh, West Coast on, and we had a terrible typhoon during which only ice cream was served. I remember a trip in a train to the Great Wall with lots and lots of snow. So this must have been very early in '37. Um, and a dog snapping at me in a garden in Japan. Um, you said the Great Wall. Great Wall. Which Great Wall? Great Wall of China. And then you talked about Japan. Well, because simply because these memories are just right. isolated things that I remember. Yeah. All right. Um, but we went from China to Japan. Oh, I remember also in Shanghai. Uh, my, my mother had told my uh, Anglo-Portuguese, I suppose her name was, uh, had, she had a Portuguese name, she was probably from Goa, uh, Nanny, that I had to be able to read before this trip because I might be left on my own. <coughs> so I was able to read. And there were a couple of trips, and one in Shanghai, I remember, 
when my parents went off sightseeing and I was left alone, I remember ringing for the for the um, the room service and saying where were my parents and was reassured that they'd be coming back. So I went back to my books. <coughs> so uh, the, the, I think the last memory I have is of listening to the radio of the coronation in New York. Um, and then so I come back to, we come back to Britain and I go to uh, Craigflower, which I don't know if it's still in existence, now, in Torreburn in Fife. And um, this is a school, a prep school, yes. Yeah. Uh, Frank Wales was the headmaster. So you went to a boarding school at the age of seven. Yes, and someone who is now in the House of Lords, uh, Hannay, David Hannay, mm. was also there, but he had the distinction of being only six. <laughs> he had these tight black curls. So in the in the parlance of that day, we called him Little Black Sambo. He's now totally bald. Um, and so I went there, I'm, I made my name immediately by saying, where's the steward to take my bag? <laughs> Having just come off a ship. <laughs> um, and I remember quite a bit about my prep school. And we, my mother stayed in England when my father went home, to, back to India to help rule it. Um, and we spent a couple of summers in Jersey. Um, and then uh, they got me evacuated in 1940, uh, as the possibilities of invasion looked very serious. Well, I mean, many people, including my ghost story relative, were desperately unhappy when they were first sent to school. Many, many stories of this of being away from your parents for the first time in a boys dormitory and so on. Do you remember that? No, I have a different memory. I don't remember that. I, I think I cried when my mm. mother left that mm. that afternoon or whenever it was. Um, but I have no memory of it. I think I did, but I, I sort of, that would be a reconstruction. Uh, what I do remember very strongly, however, um, which would be the equivalent is when I went to uh, Fetis, the first, uh, we came back to, to this country from India, my mother and myself just, um, in 44, as we arrived at Glasgow, the boats were getting ready for D-Day. Um, and I remember that she stayed for about a year, and her second sister, the one who said that if that's a baby, I'll take dogs, uh, was going to look after me and give me housing with her daughter, who's five years younger than I, um, while my parents were both in India. And I remember very distinctly the walking down the platform, I don't know if it's King's Cross, I think it was, that we used to go to, it was in Houston, um, taking LNER, um, and seeing my aunt at the gate ready to greet me and suddenly realizing it wasn't my mother who was greeting me and there's sort of some, something happened inside me. How old were you? I would have been, uh, let's see, that was been 44, 1944, so, so I would have been uh, 14, 14 hmm. just 14. And something clenched or inside me and I think uh, from that point on, I was um, uh, more inclined to be emotionally self-reliant. Uh, I think my mother noticed the difference uh, because one realized one was not always going to be in the comfort of one's home. But you'd already been at school. I'd already been at school, but every holiday she was there to oh, greet I me. I see. Um, when, when you were at your, before you went to Fetis, were, did you have any particular enthusiasms, hobbies, passions, interests? Were you an outdoor person or a, a stamp collector or a <laughs> <laughs> played with metal soldiers of the Raj or anything? I certainly had soldiers. I certainly had stamps at some point. 
Um, I know when I came back to my prep school for one semester to take common entrance, um, I uh, was, and my wife will not believe this, uh, I was the champion swimmer, it turned out. Uh, I won every swimming race in the, in the sports uh, and also got the prize for sharp shooting. <laughs> um, simply because, I don't know, I must have been swimming a lot while I was in India. And, um, uh, but that was, uh, that was an odd time, moving from, the, from back to that school. I, uh, I don't think there was anyone I remembered from before. I don't think David Hadley was still there. Um, was there cruelty? Or? No, what there was, I'll tell you what there was, and this is a, obviously a very common phenomenon, talk, much talked about nowadays more than it was then. Uh, there was a master there who told the most wonderful ghost stories. Oh, that's all right to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it isn't. Uh, and he would tell them, and he would say, turn off the lights, we'd gather mm. around in a circle, and all we'd see as a light would be the tip of his cigarette. And he'd tell these stories. And uh, I didn't particularly like him. Um, and I said he wasn't one of his favorites, but uh, I loved his stories. And then, um, after half term one time, one of the one of the people of my age group, uh, were to, this is when I'm, this is when uh, the first spell of two years at mm. Venice before going at Craig Flower before going to India, um, one of the guys in my group and he, let's see, 1940, we must have been about ten then. Mm. Um, uh, he said he'd come back. He'd spent his half term in Edinburgh and we didn't believe the story because he said we'd gone out and got some kind of a branch and insisted that uh, this boy beat him with it and so we thought this is very strange behavior <laughs> very strange behavior uh, I don't think uh, I, I, I certainly didn't I don't know I don't think anyone else told the headmaster um, because they were very upright people I, I, I say that not with my tongue in my cheek. Mm. They were an mm. uh, upright couple who ran it, school, and they would have sacked him immediately. Um, but that, I remember, the bullying in, there was one boy who was a bully, he bullied us all at some point, and he, he took it in turns to bully each person. Uh, I remember his name too, but I won't mention it. Um, but he then moved on, he was an equal opportunity bullier, and uh, you could be his best <laughs> friend next time. Um, do you think this backwards and forwards between an Indian background and the West and then going back to India for a few more years and then coming back here, has that shaken you up, so to speak, intellectually and emotionally in a way which might be one of the hints as to why you became later interested in China and the Far East? No, it's got nothing to do with China and the Far East. Um, what that movement to and fro did, I think, for me, was two things, well, a number of things. One is, uh, it made me very proud of what Britain had achieved. I mean, I didn't know about colonial massacres, probably hadn't heard the word Jalil Even though you were in Amritsar. <laughs> Even though I was in Amritsar, I probably hadn't heard the word Jalil or Um And, um, you know, I felt my father was, you know, doing amazing work. And I said, thought that particularly when, of course, he was uh, riding the countryside to his villages rather than when he was going to some government office in Delhi. But um, it meant I was very different we were very different because there were other people who'd been abroad, obviously, in my school, um, from people who'd grown up 
in the home counties or in the our case in Scotland and the, the northern part of England where I think we used to get quite a few boys from Newcastle to mm. come to Fettis, um, whose horizons were much smaller. Um, so I think there was a difference there. Um, the sights are more basically I think the sights and sounds and smells of childhood were not British, not English, not Scottish. Um, they were Indian. Um, and I think what it made me feel was much more patriotic perhaps even. I wasn't overtly patriotic, I didn't go around for waving a flag or anything, but in the sense that I didn't take Britain for granted as people who grew up in Britain possibly did. Um, it was a country which had ruled this incredible place out there called India and other places as well. And uh, it was a country greatly to be admired. So in that sense it may, may be different, but I don't think the toing and froing did much. To, it didn't shake me up in any particular way, it just, just took it as normal. Let's, let's move on to Fetis, um, which is of course a very famous, interesting school. Um, can you just give us one or two of your memories of, it's probably a hearty school, you probably ran around the countryside and things like that as well. Well, one of my proudest memories early on was my mother's story that she'd met on a train some man who, and they were discussing their sons, and she said her son was at Fetis, and he said, yes, my son was there too, but it was really too tough, so I took him away and sent him to rugby. <laughs> <laughs> that made me feel very good. <laughs> and we had, of course, cold showers, cold baths if you're a prefect, um, and... Uh, Beating uh, and... Beating, I was beaten by prefects, and as a prefect, I beat. Mm. Um, and that that didn't it didn't seem to me uh, to be an affront to my dignity in any particular way. Just sort of part of what the place was about. Um, and no, none of the masters, as far as I could tell, certainly not in my house, uh, took any particular pleasure in beating. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure I was beaten ever by the housemaster, I think only by prefects. Um, you know, they, I don't know how it was at Sedberg, but um, uh, you, you went into the changing room, you bent over, and the prefects, it was four, four prefects, took a run at you and mm. hit you with a stick, with a cane. And it hurt briefly, but it wasn't very serious. Um, Maybe I was, that's right, I think I may have once been beaten by the house master because the science master, Lodge, who was a relative of a famous Lodge, who was a scientist, found me looking at cricket scores in physics. <laughs> and I think I was beaten by the house master for that. Um, uh, there was bullying. And there was homosexuality. Fortunately, I never attracted anyone, <laughs> uh, nor was attracted to. Um, but uh, on the whole, once you got past your first year or two of not knowing where you were, well, about a year, you had to grow up pretty quickly. Um, it became routine. You did your work, you went and played your games, rugger, cricket, field hockey. Uh, I, I was, I liked cricket most and hockey second and sadly because it was the be all and end all of sport at uh, Fetis, was not as good at rugger. Um, and the, the first teams that I made were actually in squash and fives. Um, but uh, I don't think I have anything special to remember about it that hundreds of thousands of young boys in this century, last century rather, have uh, experienced, including yourself. Were there any teachers during your time at Fetis who you particularly remember as 
inspiring you or uh, enthusing you or you know the sad thing is uh, that the answer to that is probably no uh, I mean it may be that some inspiration crept in and I just don't recognize it I can remember th I thinking of three teachers we had a headmaster called Crichton Miller who was a famous yes uh, was he famous mm -hmm. yeah um, who was um, who was looked and felt to be at least sort of rather uncultured his wife was very cultured and uh, the uh, the, re the religion master the English master um, who was a reverend um, said I always do my plays for her she's the person who I, I do the plays for uh, so I did some acting um, in fact one of my best friends from those days uh, very few but one of them uh, played my daughter in a play by called Thunder Rock by Robert Ardrey which you may remember in a later career of totally different books mm -hmm. um, and um, the, so I remember him I, yes I remember him but he probably did have an influence on me in the sense of uh, he said, uh, you know, he said, when you go to Oxford, most people from Fedders went to Cambridge for some reason, but I was going to Oxford. Uh, my mother had always wanted me to go to Oxford, so I went to Oxford. Um, and um, he used to say, when you go to Oxford, remember this, uh, have a good time, enjoy yourself. Uh, let the let the blue stockings of Somerville go to their libraries and get their firsts, <laughs> but you enjoy yourself. And I think that was probably the, most, the worst advice that I could have had because <laughs> it wasn't until Harvard I discovered I really liked to work <laughs> when I went there for a graduate degree. Um, I think that the uh, the my history master, since I was mainly a historian in sixth form, was not very inspiring. Once when uh, some old boys had come back, we came into the history classroom, there were only three or four of us in the history sixth, um, and there, up there, was a sign written, look here for dramatic effect, because that's what the history master always used to do, he used to look up to the left ceiling and uh, for <laughs> dramatic effect um, he had one effect on me which I to some extent regret because he had said he said to me you know no one's ever been to Keeble from this university from this college um, why don't you apply to Keeble so I did and I got in and it's you know just want to go Keeble. to an ugly college if one's going to walk <laughs> um, but anyway um, there was one master who believed I was semi-genius, but um, he didn't teach me too much, I don't think. Um, there were, no, I, uh, sad to say that there was no great awakening by one master there. There really wasn't. What about um, religion? Because this is the time, I don't, we didn't talk about your parents faith or absence of faith, but presumably it was C of E, Church of England, your parents? No, my father's Presbyterian. Presbyterian. So, were you brought up as a Presbyterian? No, I was brought up, uh, well, I, when I was in India, I was sent to Sunday school, mm -hmm. and I was sent to church. My father would say, I'm not going to church till this war has ended. But he never went to church, even when the war had ended. <laughs> Um, my, his mother used to go to church, he used to take me to church yeah. when I spent holidays with her in Inverness. Um, but it basically was not a church-going family at all. Um, which is not to say I, that my mother didn't believe, because I think she did, but she didn't go to church. Um, the uh, funny thing is that um, I went once on a Sunday I must have been about 12, 13 at the time. And I arrived late to church, and there was a, a captain there, who also in a uniform, also late. 
and we sat together and afterwards he said, can I give you lunch? And it wasn't that I was suspicious of him or anything, but I said, no, no, no. My mother always has a lot of people for lunch on Sundays. You come uh, And so um, Captain Burrows, as he then was, um, came home for lunch and stayed till we left India. <laughs> uh, he, we put a tent in our garden, front garden, and he lived in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he he was actually working. Uh, he was in te- intelligence, and his boss was Brigadier Enoch Powell. Mm. And um, I once rang him up, Gordon Burrows, his, my friend, and and um, Powell came on the phone, and I said, "Could I speak to Gordon Burrows, please?" <laughs> Who shall I say speaking? Robert Parker. Gordon, Madge Crocker for you. <laughs> and from then on, some of my friends referred to me as Madge. <laughs> um, so those were happy days, actually. What about, uh, do, were you confirmed? Oh, back to that back religion. To religion. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try and squeeze some religion out of you. Yes, it's very interesting. Um, I was confirmed but only because I decided to get confirmed it was mm. seemed to be the right thing to do yeah. and in fact there was another boy there whose parents I think were in Singapore who'd never even been baptized so I was his godfather <laughs> uh, well, so he was baptized and I was confirmed <laughs> but that was only because I t- mm. chose to do it and did it in Church of England not Presbyterian but um, uh, because I think that the I think the services must have been well, they must have been ecumenical to some extent, but I think they're basically what Church of England services at Fed is. Uh, it was a very Anglo-ish school. Um, Did that mean, does that mean that you went through a religious no. phase of anything? No. No? It was just a rite of passage. Do, have you ever been religious or interested in religion? I've been very interested in religion, but more from the cultural historical angle um, uh, to what extent were the the events in the Middle East to what extent they happen mm. I got very uh, struck on uh, a author we probably haven't heard of Velikovsky he wrote books he was a very brilliant guy apparently he wrote books which were published I think in the late 60s where he was examining uh, Middle Eastern history and reordering the history so that the calendars of the Jews and the Egyptians were better in sync than he pointed out all sorts of things that were wrong. He also said other things. The one thing he said which which was discovered to be true which was the about the uh, atmosphere of, of Saturn, which everyone had thought was X, and he said it was Y, and they finally discovered it was Y. But um, uh, so I'm interested in what happened then, why did it happen, uh, what was the relationship there uh, between the various races and the creeds that arose out of the Middle East. Um, in India, I was uh, mostly I my North India, as you know, is more Muslim dominated. Mm-hmm. You have to see great temples. You have to go to the south for the Hindus, um, and we had Muslim servants as the main servants in the in the household. So I wasn't exposed really very much to the panoply of Hindu gods and goddesses. Uh, in my youth. Um, I think the British probably had a certain aversion uh, to to that. Um, But um, no, no religious phase, just really a fascination with um, how it all arose and the impact it's had. The other thing that often strikes one in about that age is music, either, in my case, pop music and Lonnie Donegan and Elvis Presley, 
and or classical music. Has music been important in your life? Yes, it, ha it, it has and is. Um, my pops were the uh, wonderful music from Jerome Kern and George Gershwin and others mm -hmm. from the 30s. Mm -hmm. That music I don't think has ever been beat. My mother once uh, in a French nightclub uh, when I was with my parents, we were doing a continental trip in, I think it was the late 40s, uh, was offered a job in the nightclub when she sang Blue Moon with the band. <laughs> um, so those were my pops. But when I went to, when I got to Oxford, I, you know, I'd been hearing my mother singing classical songs uh, all my life and hadn't paid too much attention because my father was totally amusical as far as mm. I could tell. Um, but I did set myself a course of listening when I was at Oxford and started uh, with um, Palestrina and people like that and then they got on to the classics, uh, the romantic classics um, and got into, I think I was graduating about the time I was Brahms. Um, <laughs> And, but the, the one, the great musical experience of my life was when I was in the army, in, I chose, uh, I went to officer cadet school and then I could choose where to go in the Royal Armoured Corps. I chose the 4th Royal Tank Regiment because it was in the Suez Canal Zone. Because we'd gone through on the boat and it always looked so glamorous. When I got there and was a soldier there, it was very boring, but I didn't know that. And I, the, the, the colonel sent me up to Faid, which was a regional headquarters, uh, to study pay system because um, the, the person in my company ran the pay, with, uh, he wanted to replace him. And um, while I was sitting in the grounds of this place, I don't know what it was, an officer's club or something, where I, on a Sunday, in the bright sunshine, Egyptian sunshine, uh, the BBC was on, and they played Jeanette Neveu playing Sibelius's violin concerto. And I have, that sort of a lifelong love affair with Sibelius for me. And when uh, Delina and I went to Finland uh, a few years ago, we went up and saw the various Sibelius places. Um, so yes, it meant a great deal and uh, uh, I listened quite a lot. Does it in any way influence your intellectual life? I mean, there are people like the great historian, legal historian Maitland, who always tended to write to, to Wagner or uh, other people write to music or uh, when they want inspiration, listen to music? Or do you, is it just something to relax with for you? It's something to give one joy. Um, no, I don't... Uh, I find music tends to distract nowadays. I think I possibly, when I was an undergraduate, I may have listened to music while studying. Um, I don't remember that now. But... Uh, on the whole, I, I kept the study of music, you know, this course I set myself over the years, uh, separate, so that I actually listened to the music and was not studying at the same time. Um, no, uh, uh, it doesn't really spill over, it's music. Uh, and uh, the other part of music that I love is the music to which you can dance. Mm -hmm. My wife loves ballet. I'm not so keen on ballet, but uh, uh, West Side Story type dancing, that's mine. So let's just finish um, this first part of the interview with Oxford. Uh, as you say, Keeble was both a religious and aesthetically not a very joyous place, but did you enjoy your time at Oxford? Yes, it was licensed idleness. Maybe it mm. still is, I don't know. But um, I do regret, as I mentioned earlier, that it was only when I got to Harvard as a, as a graduate student, postgraduate student, that I began to feel the love of 
just working all out. Uh, when I got to Harvard, I should say that uh, I think I spent my first afternoon there uh, listening in the music library uh, to a recording of um, The Tempest, not The Tempest, um, um, Twelfth Night. Um, where's my brother, Captain? Uh, oh no, this is Illyria lady, but my brother's in Elysium. And I remember thinking, oh, I can, I know how to enjoy a university now. I've been at Oxford, I can enjoy. And then I started by Chinese, and I realized that there was going to be no way that I was going to be able to enjoy the university in the way that I had enjoyed Oxford. So in Oxford, I, I worked moderately hard. You did history, right? No, I didn't. I came up... For PPE. PPE. They, they, for some reason, they were reluctant to let me change when no student really graduated in philosophy from a, high, from a public school in those days. So mm. why wouldn't I come from history? Um, but they did. And um, uh, I wanted to do philosophy. I thought it would be the great, you know, Plato, Aristotle, etc. Mm. Et and there was Strawson. Mm -hmm. brilliant man mm -hmm. hadn't written his book yet mm -hmm. and he would be, be on the whiteboard <laughs> and then he would look around the blackboard at the class and say see it's very simple and there were all these symbols on the bloody blackboard <laughs> and I couldn't understand what he was saying but more importantly I wasn't interested it really wasn't interested I had Basil Mitchell was my uh, uh, was my uh, uh, philosophy tutor uh, more into a history of religion, I think. Um, and he didn't know anything about this, so he was no help. So um, I basically, I went to the historical end of the politi politics uh, mm. section of PPE. Mm. Um, Did you go to Isaiah Berlin? I heard him once. Uh, I think all of us uh, doing PPE that year, this is... Um, uh, this was 50, I started in 50, uh, there was a, a very attractive, uh, must be about 40-ish, woman uh, lecturer in economics. Uh, and she gave, I think, the basic course in economics. We all attended that. Do you remember who it was? I can't remember the name. Eileen Power. I think she was a bit older than that, probably. Um, I don't remember... I, I think I would recognise the name if you said it, but I don't remember it. She wasn't um, a Marxist. Well, it wasn't Joan Robinson. No, it certainly was not Joan Robinson. No. <laughs> wasn't she here? She was here, yes. Yeah. Later, uh, anyway. Um, uh, and um, the attitude that I got inculcated, first from my English teacher at Fetis, said, mm. you know, enjoy yourself, and then from my economics tutor, uh, Lloyd Jones. Oh yes. Um, very nice man. Um, sent me off to America on saying you must look up this professor. He was here as a visitor. Packs a pretty martini. <laughs> um, but he, on my first uh, visit with him, we were discussing what lectures I should go to. He said, "Well, there's this one which is really quite interesting, but." It's at nine o'clock, so perhaps you won't want to go to that. <laughs> and I, you know, it somehow, it raised my spirits and depressed them at the same time. Mm. I wasn't going to have to get up early. Mm. So, um, no, in Oxford, I did a lot of acting. Mm. Uh, I, Richardson was the chairman of Ouds, mm -hmm. but I didn't really do anything at Ouds. I did a lot of ET, uh, ETC, mm. Experimental Theatre Club, and I did, uh, we had a, I had a friend in Keeble who um, was a, uh, uh, a very keen actor and he was doing a lot and he took me into his plays that often one actors, mm -hmm. uh, which we did. So I enjoyed that. I enjoyed all the other things of Oxford one enjoys. So I took my English teacher's words to heart. And you later became a politician at least a member of the House of Commons, whether that's the same thing. And uh, were you one of these prodigious people who went to the Oxford Union and made your starring debut? There? I went. I went to the Oxford Union uh, quite religiously uh, to listen to the debates uh, in my first year, and um, 
Willie Rees Mogg was the chairman of, uh, was the president of the union uh, my first term. I can't remember who was my second term, but the president in my term when I did my maiden speech was Jeremy Thorpe. Hmm. And uh, he said to me, uh, remember when you're speaking that all these other people probably are too cowardly to speak, which was, you know, good advice. He was very present. Um, and I got quite a good write-up actually in the Cambridge magazine because there was a Fatesian at Oxford who wrote for that Cambridge magazine and he was there writing up the union debate. But I made a dreadful speech <laughs> and I never spoke again at the union. <laughs> I felt um, it was just dreadful. Uh, so though all budding politicians who know anything about anything keep to the union, meet all the, the grandees from London coming down. I didn't do any of that. And I joined all the all the clubs, not the Conservative Club, I joined the Labour Club, the Liberal Club, but particularly in the Liberal Club because, because the girls were prettier. Um, you didn't join the Communist Club, which no. I did because the girls were prettier. Um, no, I didn't. Um, and, and Dorothy Woodman, hmm. uh, Kingsley Martin's wife, once said to me, um, you know, your generation, I feel we lost you because you all read Darkness at Noon. <laughs> and I had read Darkness at Noon, so mm. it, and it certainly did affect me. Um, so I wasn't involved politically, but I knew that um, I wanted to go into politics more Even than anything then. else. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, the question was, the real question in my mind, and this may be of some interest, um, was what you do when you're not in politics. You know, if you're Bill Clinton, you're always in politics, mm. but ever, all the rest of us have to do something else. <laughs> um, and most conservatives would become barristers or be in the city. And when they'd earn their pile, they'd go in. And most labor in those days were secondary school teachers. And I wanted to be neither. So I thought journalism would be a good career. And um, in those days, and maybe today, uh, the NUJ... Um, National Union of Journalists. National Union of Journalists uh, had strict rules that uh, in order to get a job on a London paper, which is a means a national paper, um, you had to have three years in the provinces doing hatches, matches and dispatches. <laughs> and then you could come down to London and if you were lucky you might get a job on a paper which you wanted to get a job on. So that struck me as being a bad way to go. Mm -hmm. And there was only one way, and that was to be able to do something which Buggins couldn't do. So I thought, that's the way to go. I'll know something that Buggins doesn't know. And of course, India was obvious, but I felt that there was no value added in India. Too many people knew about India. But there had been a revolution in China only about three years ago. Um, and people would need to know about the Chinese revolution. And so I learned about China. So I went to the professor of Chinese at Oxford, who had to be an American. His name was Homer Dubbs, and he was. And uh, when he discovered that I was not interested in studying the Han Dynasty with him, uh, so I didn't want to be his student, which was all he was trying to avoid, um, <laughs> he became very friendly <laughs> and talked talk, talk to me about um, how I could go about studying Chinese in America. And he said, well, that Yale did a lot of work with the armed forces during the war, but they had their own Romanization system and it's mainly language. But Fairbank at Harvard has just started a few years ago this MA program where you can do language but also do politics and economics and so on. And so that seemed like the royal route to me, so that's what I did. I thought I should go back a little bit in time because a couple of influences on my on my later life, which I didn't refer to, uh, two sort of second-rate books, I think people might describe them as, had quite a big effect. I mean, I read, I was given by a master at school 
uh, a book by Jode, you remember? Yes, C.E.M. Jode. C.E.M. Jode, one of the public intellectuals of the 50s and 40s. And it was just a, an introduction to politics, I think. But that's when I became convinced that I should be a Labour supporter, mm. not anything else. Um, so um, that was quite very important for me. And the other, because having been brought up in uh, India, I had no particular political affiliation. My father was a civil servant and didn't believe in he should have a political affiliation. Um, the other one was uh, uh, Emery Reeves. I don't know if you remember him. He was sort of a, a, a fixer for Churchill, financial fixer, publishing fixer, late in Churchill's life, I think. And he wrote a book called The Anatomy of Peace, which is about the need for world government. And that made me into a world government person, but uh, more importantly, uh, since you don't get there in a single step, it made me into a Europeanist. So I became a very strong Europeanist from my teens to this very day. Good. The last Remainer <laughs> has come over from America. Right. Um, right. Well, uh, where we got to last time was that you were just going off to America to work with Fairbanks. So, um, tell me of your first impressions of going to that centre and meeting Fairbanks. I already told you about how I heard about him. Yes. Um, you, you met a, a, Homer Chi Nubs. a Chinese, yes, that's right, who d was relieved to find right. that you didn't want to work with him. Right. Um, Fairbanks was a rather aloof in manner. He was a tall man. Um, sparse of speech uh, and somewhat aloof in manner except when he was actually lecturing um, he greeted me with uh, uh, great good humor but he greeted all of us with great good humor because there were very few of us there were about uh, in this MA program which Fairbank had set up there were about in my year there were about four or five of us and he was looking for more converts, more people to study China and understand how important China should be for all of us. And so he greeted all of us with great good cheer. Um, and we weren't particularly close. I don't think he was particularly close to any students, um, but he monitored them and mentored them uh, well. I took him to lunch uh, at the end of my first year uh, it being a two-year program, and I said, <clears throat> I knew what I was going to had written about uh, the uh, my paper for the first year, my major paper. Uh, I knew what I was going to do and had done it, uh, but I didn't have an idea for my second year. And at lunch, he suggested the topic, and uh, it was a good topic. I wrote about it, and it was published in his series of cyclostyled papers. Um, and we became good friends thereafter. Uh, his wife, um, uh, who was of a very distinguished Cambridge family, her father was a famous doctor, um, was much uh, more livelier. I mean, when Fairbank felt he had to go to bed early because he had to be in full command of his faculties the following morning, uh, she would be happy to dance the night away. <laughs> and. Um, uh, she gave a, a very human touch to the Fairbank family um, and uh, they used to hold teas every once a week for students and I almost was uh, incurred her total displeasure because having grown up in India I, I asked for milk and sugar for my tea whereas this was apparently some good Chinese tea and uh, that was at least <laughs> majesty to ask for it. However, she forgave me and we became good friends and the Fairbanks uh, used to stay with us. They stayed with us when we were, I had a fellowship at Columbia, they stayed with us in London. And at one point later, much later, um, when I was in fact in Parliament, I think, uh, Fairbanks said, why don't you take one of your books and turn it into a PhD? And I said, why? And he said, why not? <laughs> and so uh, thought about it, registered at LSE uh, under f an old friend, Leonard Shapiro, who was a Soviet specialist, 
And uh, when I lost my seat in the Thatcher Revolution, I took one of my books and cut out half the text, half the footnotes, and turned it into a PhD. So that when I went to Harvard um, later to become a faculty member, the dean who had been in Japanese class with me years earlier said, and of course you don't have a PhD, because no man of my generation or student of my generation would have had one. Um, and I said, actually, <laughs> I do. It didn't make any difference to salary, unfortunately, but uh, it just uh, meant I was more in keeping with the common, uh, the common herd of faculty members. So Fairbank was very important because I was still not... Uh, when Harvard was trying to recruit me, which was in the early 80s after I had left politics, but I hadn't fully left and I was going to fight again as a social democrat in 83, um, Fairbank wrote me what I can only call sort of um, academic love letters. I mean, he really was trying to persuade me to come to to uh, Harvard. Um, and uh, when I came to Harvard, when I did accept the offer, uh, he introduced me to uh, the places which he thought were the most important societies on the campus of faculty members and so on. So he was very solicitous. Once he took with you, uh, took up with you, he was very solicitous. He was a sort of patron. He was. Yeah. He was. So you did a two-year two MA. Um, you didn't mention what your, the, the subject he suge suggested you Okay. Oh, it, the subject he suggested was the Huampua Military Academy, which was the academy which the Russian Soviets set up with Sun Yat-sen mm. in uh, South China, at Huampu in South China. And um, Jiang Kai-shek was the head of the academy. Uh, Lin Biao, one of the great generals of the People's mm. Republic Army, was one of the uh, pupils, early pupils at that academy. Uh, Zhou Enlai was the effectively the political uh, faculty member, uh, faculty member who taught politics, uh, because the, the the top man was a, a nationalist politician who never had time to do it. So Zhou Enlai was very intimate with all these future generals of the People's Republic Army, and some who became generals of the Guomindang Army. Um, so that was the subject he suggested. There were f a few books in Chinese in the Library of Congress, which I managed to get hold of, and um, um, I think it's occasionally still cited. Hmm. When and how did you learn Chinese in, in depth to, to read and write? Well, uh, one has to understand that in those days, the early 50s, uh, the China field, uh, Fairbank obviously, was run basically by historians mm -hmm. and they were interested in on reading Chinese, they weren't mm -hmm. interested in one particularly speaking mm -hmm. and uh, many Sinologists, not just in America but in Britain too, uh, of that generation did not speak very good Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and I only had a one semester of spoken Chinese. Today you'd be immersed totally in spoken mm. Chinese and we are training very good people in terms of spoken language. Um, but they were interested in reading and uh, I would say that after two years uh, I could very very slowly uh, read a People's Daily editorial. So I had to, when I returned to England and started working uh, for the Daily Telegraph, I had to keep on with my reading. I would subscribe to the People's Daily and um, other Chinese uh, magazines, and um, I uh, gradually got better. Mm. Took time, mm. but speaking because I never went into China uh, until a later age. I never. Uh, I've never been a fluent speaker. Mm. My wife then wife who later died uh, who took the same program as me a few years after me um, and who had a year with a, living with a Taiwanese family in Taiwan uh, she spoke much better than I did. Hmm. When, you, when you came back, you came back 
to journalism, to the Telegraph. Were you by then convinced you, your future was related to Chinese topics or...? No, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I've made this clear before, uh, why I went into journalism. No. I went into journalism because I intended to go into politics and you oh, have to have right. another career yeah. unless you're Bill Clinton and you're a totally politician. Um, and most Labour people were sec usually secondary school teachers. Mm. It seemed like most Conservatives looked like they were barristers before mm. they went in. Um, I didn't want to do either of those things. I thought journalism would be a good career to fall in and out of mm. uh, politics. To get into journalism in those days, to get to a Fleet Street newspaper, uh, to get past the union rules, you had to spend three years in the provinces, hatches, matches, and dispatches, mm. and then you could come to London and maybe mm. you get a job on a mm. paper you wanted. I decided that I'd have to do the royal route, which was knowing something that Buggins didn't know. Mm. And uh, there had been a Chinese revolution. Mm. Uh, I thought papers would need to know about the Chinese revolution. Mm. And so I decided to learn Chinese. It was purely a means to a means to an end. Oh, right. um, and uh, I never had any misty feeling about Ming vases or uh, anything like that. Um, it was just... It was just I remember, in fact, at our very first seminar, uh, John Fairbank saying to the new arrived class, a half dozen of us, saying how he got into China. He was a student of British history when he went to uh, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. And he got involved in British imperial history. And that involved him a little bit in the China side and then he heard that there were some archives opening up in China and he went off to China and he learned Chinese in Beijing and he said um, China has a way of taking you over and I distinctly remember saying under my breath not me <laughs> but it did <laughs> one of the few times I've been wrong <laughs> lucky to be able to say that um, is there anything you want to say about your time as a journalist either then or later, because um, you worked for the BBC as well, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Um, as a journalist, I was totally unsuccessful in getting into China. I applied for a, my first application visa, went in in 55, and uh, they kept telling me at the Chinese Embassy, we haven't yet heard from Beijing. Um, and so I never got a visa, never got a visa. During, my, during that period, uh, they did admit the Daily Telegraph correspondent from Tokyo uh, twice uh, and uh, it was widely rumoured and later I found out to be rumoured correctly uh, that he wrote so seldom for the Telegraph that he must be an employee of MI6 <laughs> and so the Chinese gave him two visas a, an accredited spy if you like <laughs> instead of a bright-eyed bushy-tailed young man who in principle might have been influenced by them. Um, so I didn't get in till uh, 72, by which time I was no longer a journalist, so I posed as a journalist. And the one of the escorting officers for that trip, it was Alec Douglas Hume as Foreign Secretary, going in on a goodwill visit because we just exchanged ambassadors for the first time. Um, uh, the, the Chinese minder saying to me, looking me straight in the eye, and saying, Mr. McFarker, this is a goodwill visit, so we decided to accept, as a journalist, anyone the British said was a journalist. In <laughs> other words, don't try it again. Uh, he later became ambassador to Britain. <laughs> but uh, by that time, I had um, left the Telegraph. I'd gone into, I had gone into, um, to uh, television for a time, and. Um, was generally sort of a freelance scholar broadcaster. Um, Tell me about the, the going into television because you started twenty four hours. Or oh, that was later. Yes, that was later. Uh, television twenty four hours was a BBC overseas service from Bush House. Mm. Um, television. I I had a I had a uh, a, a graduate student who had been at. Um, at St. Anthony's when I was an undergraduate, we got to know each other through one of the seminars, he suddenly turned up at my doorstep uh, 
in the when I was working for the Telegraph and said, uh, "Would I like a fellowship?" He was uh, uh, starting a new program at the Rockefeller uh, uh, Institute, uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation, and uh, he was handing out fellowships. So I took a fellowship for a year <laughs> to start what turned out to be a series of books on China. Um, and during that time, I was approached by my, one of my fellow world government people, mm. a friend, uh, David Webster, who was a producer with uh, Panorama, did a screen test and uh, was asked to join Panorama. So I didn't go back to the Daily Telegraph, I, uh, which was the only paper, incidentally, I wrote to all of them, mm. was prepared to employ me as a China <laughs> specialist. Um, and I should say, before I leave journalism, is that uh, when I was at the Telegraph, um, I worked under and with the Soviet specialist, uh, a man who had been, I think in his youth, a, a, a communist, but had uh, seen the error of his ways, perhaps, and uh, was fairly anti-communist, but understood the Soviet system very well. And so I learnt about the Chinese system via the Soviet system to some extent. Um, and that, uh, that of course, uh, the Soviet Union being the Soviet Union, did not endear the Chinese system to me. Um, so I started off with a feeling that the Chinese system was um, flawed. Um, but we won't go into that. But um, so when I went into television, uh, I didn't go to China at all. As a journalist with the Telegraph, I didn't go to China. Um, I covered for Panorama, I covered ordinary things, uh, foreign affairs, but also domestic subjects like anyone else. And then, uh, then uh, by that time I was trying to get into Parliament, um, and that took longer than uh, I had hoped because uh, uh, China had taken me over to some extent. I was editing the China Quarterly, it started the China Quarterly in 59 and edited that till 68. So I was getting more and more involved with China, I was writing books about China. Um, and um, my entry into politics would have happened earlier, I think, if I'd had a dull job. <laughs> something that really didn't interest me hmm. because I'd been trying to get into politics sooner. Um, so I didn't actually get in until February 74. What What were the books you were writing about China in the... Well, I was commissioned the first book to write about uh, was um, uh, what happened during the Hundred Flowers, that hmm. uh, what did people say when they were allowed to speak. And so uh, my first book was, in fact, a collection of... Uh, uh, with essays, of course, but a collection of um, quotations from mm. very distinguished Chinese, in many cases, who uh, said things about the communist regime for which they later suffered because uh, they uh, launched an anti rightist campaign because they didn't like the way that they were attacked, the party. Um, so that was the first one. The second one, which was started off with my year with a Rockefeller grant, uh, would turn out to be published on, as I entered Parliament in '74. Uh, that was on um, uh, the uh, uh, first volume of the Origins of the Cultural Revolution. But before that, I had published a couple of books. Um, one was on the one was a a time life picture plus essay book on the Forbidden City, uh, which is worth buying for the photographs alone, they're so beautiful. Um, and the other was a, a documentary study which I did of the uh, US-China relationship uh, on the eve of Nixon's visit to China. Um, so I went into uh, politics with uh, four books under my belt, um, which is just as well because it meant that I had a credential with the China community, mm. um, which meant I had something to go out, to, uh, out into. But be before that, I had, uh, you mentioned um, uh, 24 hours, uh, I had started with John Tusa, 
uh, presenting this current affairs radio program for the BBC Overseas Service. It was great fun. Mm. And we talked to, uh, I mean, my most vivid memories of, were actually of the Argentine because all sorts of things were happening with Peron and his uh, second wife, uh, Isabelita, <laughs> taking over. Um, uh, and uh, it was great fun. And it turned out that the decision I'd made as a 19 year old that journalism would be a good career to fall back into if I ever had to leave politics was correct because I lost my seat on a Thursday, of course, because all elections are on a Thursday. On the Tuesday, 24 hours called me up and said, would I like my old job back? <laughs> the following Tuesday. The following <laughs> Tuesday. And um, uh, as one of my colleagues put it, for the equivalent of two afternoons work a week, I was paid more, my, more than my parliamentary salary. <laughs> so journalism turned out to have been a, a good bet. Hmm. Can I, this is a very broad question, but um, you started on the roots of the um, Maoist uh, revolution. What, what do you think the roots, I mean, what did you decide the roots of the Maoist revolution were? How far back did you go and what were the primary causal factors behind it? You. Oh, I think that um, I think that uh, I I don't think I'm particularly unconventional in this. So I think that the first and primary route was uh, the challenge of the West, which gradually emerged. I mean, the the end uh, the Qing Dynasty was always concerned mainly with the threat from the north, the Mongols and other peoples of the north because that's where they had come from too originally and they knew that that was a danger. So as the West encroached from the southern coast, it wasn't apparent there was that great a danger, but gradually it did and their successive attempts uh, to cope with it failed. Finally, the, uh, the, even the little Japanese transformed themselves into a Western type state and defeat them in 1894-95. And I think that Japanese defeat was the traumatic experience that led to the final abandonment of the Confucian system and in, finally to the abandonment of the imperial system in 1911-12. So I think that the impact of the West was very important for the origin, for one of the roots of, uh, of what we see in China today. The second great impact, of course, was the Russian Revolution because up till that time, anyone who studied Marxism, and there were people who studied Marxism in China, uh, assumed that the revolution couldn't take place in China. It had to take place in Germany or Britain or somewhere like that. Uh, but the Russian Revolution proved that you could in a, have a revolution in a large agrarian state. Um, and uh, the Chinese uh, people who joined the Chinese Communist Party at that time decided that, that was the way to go. The third thing I think that was in the Maoist Revolution, and this is, some people trace it to Taoism, I'm not so sure, is the sense, uh, it certainly comes out of the Soviet Revolution, uh, the sense of struggle. I mean, Mao. Uh, as one of my late colleagues put it, loved upheaval. He loved struggle. Uh, he obviously preferred it when he was struggling, he was a top guy. But <laughs> even when he was not the top guy, he loved struggle. He did not like bureaucracy. He did not like the settled existence. And he thought all life should be continually changing. Uh, and I think that does find roots in Chinese traditional philosophy. Um, so I think it's a combination of the West, the Bolshevik Revolution, and if for Mao himself, uh, a combination of uh, traditions of change and struggle and of uh, uh, rebellion. Uh, he was a great reader of the Chinese, historic, Chinese historical novels and rebellion and the rebels were big characters in his mind and that's what he became. So the, these are the 
deep roots as he's growing up and as he's forming his party. What about the sort of immediate causes, um, the warlords, the Japanese? Well, the great tragedy of Sun Yat-sen, of course, was that um, uh, that the democratic society, which polity, which he hoped to create, was set aside by uh, General Yuan Shikai, who, in fact, attempted to set up a new dynasty under himself, but failed. But uh, Warlords took over when General Yuan Shikai died because he was the only senior general to keep order. And uh, warlordism, of course, as it had done in tradition in Chinese history, convinced Chinese that they had to reunite the country because they hated to see it divided. Um, and the nationalists, uh, I think, would have div would have united the country and led the country, but for the Japanese invasion. So I think, uh, I mean, Mao is uh, reportedly said to the first delegation of Chinese, uh, Japanese businessmen who came to China in the early 50s uh, and apologized for the invasion of uh, China. Uh, he said, you know, why are you apologizing? I wouldn't be here but for <laughs> your invasion. And that's true. Uh, the, the communists had a better war than the nationalists. The nationalists lost, did more fighting, I think, than the communists, uh, lost more people. Uh, there was, but the fundamental problem with the nationalist armies, of course, was that they could never. The idea of land reform would never uh, be part of um, nationalist ideology, because the Chiang Kai-shek was too dependent upon his officer corps, who were all mainly all related to landlord families. Uh, whereas the communists could set that aside. They had their armies were basically peasant armies. Um, so I think that the um, uh, the inability of the Ch the Chinese nationalists, after a brief period of rule from 28 to 35, 37, uh, before the Japanese invasion proper, um, the inability of the nationalists really to consolidate a Chinese state in that f those few years, uh, and the Japanese invasion. It was very helpful to the Chinese Communists. I mean, the Chinese Communists did things like run an opium trade uh, in their hideouts in the northwest during the war um, that they wouldn't officially have approved of. But they, they, Mao and his colleagues instilled the discipline and the élan, which enabled them in the. Uh, mid 40s to launch the civil war and to win not as guerrilla warriors any longer but as full-fledged armies defeating full-fledged armies going to the other side of all these events um, we, we constantly over the years have asked chinese some of whom were living through the cultural revolution and onwards of their feelings and assessment of Chairman Mao as a leader, and they get, they've given us different stories, but a lot of them are of the variety, 60% good, 40% bad stuff. How would you assess Mao's contribution? You have to balance it. Well, I think the first and most important thing, and he said this on his deathbed too, uh, was that um, he managed to unite China after many years of uh, division, foreign invasion, uh, and just general disruption of the system as a result of the Western influx of ideas and of uh, armies. Um, and he, and he united the country under one central government and imposed unity upon it, with the exception, of course, of Taiwan. Um, and I think that was very important to re-establish the Chinese realm in the modern era uh, so that China could start to develop. And secondly, I think that um, uh, until fairly late, in fact when the Cultural Revolution started, 17 years later, uh, he also managed to keep 
pretty well a united leadership, which is very important. In many of developing countries, many newly independent countries, the coalition uh, which won independence uh, fell apart quickly afterwards and people fought each other. Uh, Mao, under Mao, who was unquestioned leader, uh, they stayed together by and large until uh, 1966, 17 years after they conquered power. So I think seizing power and maintaining it with a strong Communist Party till 66 uh, was definitely a Mao achievement. Um, I actually think uh, that setting aside for the moment his big disasters, the famine, the man-made famine of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution itself, in which the country seemed to be falling apart. I think that, in fact, uh, I have a slightly odd view, perhaps, of uh, his contribution. I think that what he did in the Cultural Revolution, which was to unleash the people against the party, against the government, against officialdom, was enormously important for the future of China because the rule of the bureaucracy has been unquestioned for uh, centuries in China. That's the way they rule. In fact, one Chinese official, a, a woman whom I got to know quite well, and who was very liberal in her thinking, I said to her once, well, what do you think about the prospects for democracy? And she said, democracy? We've been ruled for the last 25, 30 years by peasants by which she meant the Communist Party of China. If we have democracy, we'll be ruled by peasants forever. <laughs> and the intellectuals of China don't like that idea. They like the idea of bureaucracy and them being in charge. And I think what Mao's achievement will be seen in the, after some du long durée, perhaps, uh, as being destroying that myth of the bureaucratic system that has to run China. and opening it up to the people at large. He did it in the probably the worst possible way, but it was a dramatic way to do it. And I don't think the Chinese Communist Party, even with the anti-corruption campaigns of the present, is going to recover its original mystique because of what Mao did to it. And I think that's good for China in the long run. Of course you have to have bureaucracy. God knows the Chinese invented it and they're very good at it. <laughs> but uh, the way that uh, China has always been run by, by bureaucracy and with no in input really from the, from the populace at large, that has to change and it is beginning to change very, very slowly. And that will be seen in the long run, I think, as a Maoist achievement. Well, that actually takes me on to the next question, which is looking forward. I mean, you, were, you went in 1972 and you've been quite recently... Um, and you must have been, as we all are, amazed at what has happened in China in the last 40 years. Um, are you on the whole encouraged by what you've seen? Or? I'm enormously encouraged by what I've seen in this sense that um, I think what happened in the last uh, almost 40 years since Deng Xiaoping came back for the second time in 1979 um, has been the unleashing of the Chinese people. I mean, uh, 49 was called by the Communists officially liberation, but it wasn't. It was a straight jacketization mm -hmm. as the Marxist system, the Stalinist economic system was put on them. And what happened in, uh, in 79 and onwards was Deng Xiaoping said, for Christ's sake, we've got to get anything that will get this country moving, otherwise we're out of here. They're <laughs> going to throw us out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the result of that was, um, first of all, a revolution of the countryside, so that urban dwellers started to go to the countryside to see if it really was true that their peasants were building three-story houses, mm -hmm. because there'd never been any rural envy before. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's long past now, because the urban uh, people are doing much better. But I think that what he did, uh, what the reform did, Deng Xiaoping should get the credit, is to unleash the Chinese people, because this is a dynamic, uh, 
well educated in to at the more and more widely um, and self-confident people if given their heads uh, and Mao always talked about uh, giving the people their heads and the his communist party leader comrades did not like that idea because they were imbued with the idea of both traditional Chinese bureaucracy and Soviet communist party ideas that the party must rule, the bureaucracy must rule, the elite must rule. And Mao, uh, I mean, Mao would never like challenges to his personal authority, but challenges to the bureaucracy, fine. And I think what Deng Xiaoping did was in effect to carry out that Maoist revolution in a much more benign way than Mao himself did, by allowing people to make money. To get rich is glorious, mm. was the motto of the time. The only sad thing was that the Communist Party officials who'd been spat upon during the Cultural Revolution said, well, why shouldn't we get rich as well? So <laughs> massive corruption. Mm. So I think that um, uh, Mao, his, his face will be on the uh, Tiananmen uh, until the communist regime folds and goes away because he is still a legitimating factor. After the Cultural Revolution, the party's reputation went down, uh, its corruption has lowered its standing. Uh, people joined the Communist Party for careerist reasons, not for idealism any longer. Um, but Mao himself still legitimates what happened in '49, and what, as long as they can claim that today is a following up of '49, uh, they'll keep him up there. You said until the Communist Party fades and goes away, do do you foresee that occurring? I do foresee the Communist Party fading. How it will happen, I have not the slightest idea. But I, what I do believe is not that there is an inexorable economic law that when everyone gets to a certain level of income, suddenly they become democratic. Um, we've seen that not happen in various countries. Uh, what I do believe, however, is that uh, people as dynamic as the Chinese, uh, and as numerous as the Chinese are not going to be rulable from one center and one party and perhaps even one person, Xi Jinping or whoever it is, uh, for very much longer. Uh, they're going to be too savvy, uh, too much wishing to spread their wings and do their own thing. And the idea that uh, the party knows best and the par only the party can rule I think um, uh, it will disappear. Whether it will disappear by uh, some kind of new revolution or just gradually fade away, I don't know. But uh, I think in the long run, uh, China will end up with some form of democracy. It may not look anything like uh, American or British democracy any more than Japanese democracy looks anything like mm. British or American democracy. But it will be a a form in which there is a possibility for the people to speak their minds and to have some impact at the local level, the slightly higher level, whatever. Um, and that will come eventually, but how and when, I wouldn't speculate. When it comes, or even before it comes, uh, how successful will China be, say, in relation to Europe or America? I mean, there are economically and in other ways intellectually and I think China can can match the world in terms of uh, of uh, achievement I think the problem at the moment and this is why so many families now they can afford it send their kids abroad to be educated either in Europe or in America the problem is that uh, the a constriction, the Procrustean bed uh, of Chinese education which combines certain elements of tradition of how you learn uh, in China and also the communist tradition of you've got to learn to uh, in a certain political way, those constrictions uh, will inhibit uh, the Chinese to some extent. They obviously have not inhibited everyone because we see some amazing entrepreneurs springing up and building world-class companies 
the only problem for that uh, for that is that um, those businessmen are are subject to the poss- to the whims of the party and could disappear tomorrow and do uh, however rich they may become and um, so China is uh, China can match the world I think but China will have to do it in a different uh, with different political configuration they can call it what they want but there will have to be in my view and this was discussed in China in the 20s and rejected uh, there has to be some kind of devolution whether you call it federalist or whatever so that people at the not at the level of the nation of 1.3 billion or of a province which has maybe 50 or 60 million but people at the level of a, a county with a few tens of thousands of people can have some say in their locality um, and some say in how people are elected who will make decisions at a higher level uh, I think that has to come uh, and I think what we will see gradually emerging and it's already emerging to some extent is that some parts of China it'll be a little bit like what happened after the Soviet Union broke up some of its components were uh, very dynamic and rich and others were backward and dictatorial uh, you know the stands were mainly dictatorial whereas the Baltics were mainly democratic uh, and I think we will see that sadly some poor provinces in the northwest uh, for instance, uh, may be rather dictatorial because they don't have the people, the, di- the dynamism among the people that, for instance, Shanghai might have or Jiangsu or Zhejiang. Um, so I think I see a China which is more and more susceptible to popular, uh, popular opinion, popular uh, decisions, uh, but one which because of its vastness and because of the differentials of uh, resources, I mean both intellectual and, uh, and material, uh, will vary considerably in the degree to which you can say this is a democratic in- uh, unit. Um, Shanghai could be democratic tomorrow. It just happens to have a very strong party system because they're Shanghai and they're very bright and they think highly of themselves <laughs> and they run most of China because they have so many graduates they have to go off elsewhere and run China uh, and are resented often but um, somewhere like I don't know Gansu Yunnan mm. poorer provinces one doesn't know how they will develop mm. and when they become as they probably will the, the most powerful economy in the world, um, and maybe the most sophisticated technology, will they follow the route of Britain and then America in becoming aggressive, imperial, um, proud, um, aggressive, outward? I think I think the Chinese have already become proud and aggressive. Uh, I think they're already flexing their muscles to say we are once more the central kingdom and you Southeast Asians, you know, those little islands Mm. are actually Mm. our islands. Mm. Just keep your hands off them. Uh, So I think China, which had Southeast Asia eating out of its hands, has now antagonized almost all of them. Mm. They're still very cautious about China, of course, but but in terms of large-scale invasions, uh, for instance, to recover the territories that the Russians took from them 300 years ago. I don't think that kind of thing is going to happen. Uh, but they will be saying, we are the best, and you've got to accept that um, our ideas may be the ones that should be installed as the way that the world functions. However, I think that they may see that the system which the English-speaking peoples basically the Americans and British set up after World War II have got now some legitimacy and, and some success even if they should be reformed and I'm not sure that they'll want to upset every every uh, part of the old system of the uh, the liberal system international system because 
uh, they will be antagonizing people when they don't need to. So unless they're stupid, they won't do that. Hmm. I don't think they're stupid. <laughs> um, coming back to your own life, uh, tell me a little bit about your time as a uh, an MP and um, the joys and frustrations of that four years. I enjoyed, uh, actually five years, and I enjoyed the five years very much. Uh, one reason I enjoyed it, it was a reason I had not expected to, is I actually liked uh, the constituency work. Mm. Uh, an MP has very little power, but quite a bit of influence. Uh, most of the stuff in the constituency are controlled by the either the district council or the county council. But you have a voice with those bodies, and if they're the same party, you have a considerable influence upon them. And I liked working on behalf of people, trying to get their pension settled or whatever it was that mm. went wrong. I enjoyed that, and just as well, because um, uh, Jim Callahan did not give me any job to do, uh, though he was, uh, I was put forward by a couple of cabinet ministers. Um, and so it was just as well I got my uh, my pleasure both out of constituency work and other out of other work which I did. I set up a uh, an Indo-British uh, forum, uh, which met in India a couple of times and then met in Britain, um, uh, designed to increase uh, understanding about India in Britain before the old ties totally died out, literally. Um, and that was quite successful. It's, I think it still persists as a government organization uh, on both sides, but, which I don't think was a good idea, but there we are. Uh, so I set that up and I had a little uh, aid agreement with a constituency in England, uh, a constituency in the Punjab in India where I'd grown up. And uh, we sent funding for in, in this case, it was for medical supplies, for eye doctoring. Um, so there were other things one could do, um, including, I suppose, the most important thing I helped to do was to um, help to get the funding for the uh, Nissan Institute at Oxford, which was my sure. idea. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was very interesting how the Japanese worked. Uh, I had been agitated. The Japanese, I was at a conference in Japan, and the J Japanese people on their side said, What can we do to make antagonism to Japan uh, less in Europe? And I said, Why don't you set up uh, institutes, studies of Japanese studies, the major institutions in Britain, Germany, and France, and have them gradually spread learning about Japan to their students and Britain, uh, France and German uh, representatives did not go ahead with that but I persisted with this and uh, in my last election as a Labour Party member uh, David Owen came to speak for me and I, he was, I knew he was meeting the Japanese foreign minister in a few days. I said, David, please would you raise the issue of the idea of an institute of Japanese studies at Oxford, which is where I decided it should be, um, because it's really very important. And he, to his credit, he did. And I was told by my friends in the Japanese foreign ministry that the Japanese delegation was so impressed that the foreign secretary had raised something which was not on the agenda, <laughs> that it must be something very important to him. And so the foreign minister contacted his the ambassador in London, and the ambassador in London contacted his schoolmate, who was the head of Nissan, and the money arrived. Well, it changed my life, as I'll explain later, <laughs> that your influence changed my life. But um, coming back to your to your own life, um, if you had to, if you were going to your traditional de desert island, but on this occasion you were allowed to take two of your books and you had to justify why you thought these two books were the most important you'd, you'd written. Which would you choose and why would they, you think they'd be worth? I think I wouldn't choose them because uh, 
I'd have read them, I'd have written them, and I'd be bored with them. So yeah. I'd choose someone else's books. But if you insist on my own books, um, I think I think the book I did with this, my Swedish colleague uh, uh, Michael Schönhaus on the Cultural Revolution, one volume, um, is I think quite valuable because we are. It's the only volume that exists which considers the Cultural Revolution from the top, but also what happened at the bottom. And I think that's important for people to know and it's important for Chinese to know and it's been translated into Chinese, um, though not on the mainland, but people on the mainland have gained access to it. Uh, so I think that would be one. Um, another one, I think I'd take the, the history essays that I wrote for the, uh, the Time Life book on the Forbidden City because I wrote I read a lot of Chinese history to to write that book and um, I have been back to it one occasion to for some purpose and I was surprised at all that I'd absorbed and all that I'd found out so I'd probably take that right well I've got two more questions if if I Go may ahead. one is um, I've attempted to write a book comparing five civilizations, um, the West was divided into Europe and the Anglosphere, um, Islam, Japan and China. And the aim always is to try and get at the quintessence, the grammatical rules, the uh, what Tocqueville tried to do in his Democracy in America. Right. And I've guessed, because I don't know enough, at each of them, except the one I know quite well, which is my own. If you had to say what was the quintessence, explain what the quintessence of China as a civilization over the last 2,200 years was, what were the structural, the th two or three main structural rules that generate China, what would you... Well, I think that the opening lines of... Um of um, uh, the novel of the Three Kingdoms mm. is probably one of the essence of China. Uh, the empire united will be divided. Divided, it will be reunited. I mean, there is this primeval fear coming out of the terrible wars of the of the. Um, a warring states period uh, which led virtually all Chinese philosophers to embrace the idea of a single ruler uh, for the whole of the Chinese uh, sphere. Um, I think that's a very powerful essence, the idea that, that without unity uh, China descends into chaos. Um, but I think that what we see emerging now and we'll see more emerging is the idea that if the people can be trusted to run themselves they don't want chaos any more than anyone else and they will ensure there is no chaos but I think if the most primitive political essence of China I would say is we have to be united because united uh, we kill each other and we are killed by outsiders mm -hmm. That's the political one. Is there a social dimension that is un different from the West and but very powerful? Well, I think the respect for age is greater than it's been in the West. I mean, respect for age exists everywhere, uh, I think, uh, but it was always greater in China. Um, women have fared no better, in fact probably worse in China than many other places. Um, I would say the essence of the Chinese system, and Confucius talked about this and others have, uh, the essence of the system is the idea that at the root of uh, civilization is the strong family. I remember one of my most distinguished colleagues in political science at Harvard giving a talk 
and he used to study, he's dead now, he used to study uh, criminals and pr prisons and things like that. And people used to ask him, why do you study it? It's not traditional political science. And he said, the reason I study this is because the basis of political science is order. That has to be political order. Mm. And uh, crime is an example of how political order is disrupted. So I'm interested in how it's disrupted. And he said, uh, you know, I've been to the philosophers, and none of them de deal with the family, which I have found by studying the criminals, that is the most important element in disorder and criminal behavior being formed. And none of the traditional philosophers, Plato, anyone like that, has uh, ever studied that. And I said, I said, you know, there was one political <laughs> philosopher who did study the family and see it at the basis of a sound state, and that was Confucius. And I think uh, socially, I think that uh, probably the Chinese put the family still, and you see this with the diaspora now from Hong Kong to Vancouver, from uh, Beijing to California, you see the, the family is still this incredibly powerful unit. And the clan, of course, but that's a more amorphous thing, especially in today's, uh, today's uh, age of travel and dispersal. But the family unit, I think, is, I would say, is one of the essences. One last question. Um, you've been incredibly productive and also moved from journalism to politics to administration to writing. How do you manage, well, particularly with the writing? Uh, do you write uh, in bursts? Do you write? Do your ideas come when you go for walks? Can you tell, tell me something about your working methods, really? I think that the um, I think looking back, most of my best ideas, and it's normally thought to apply to mathematicians. I think came uh, when I was younger, uh, when you take risks. How young? In my twenties, early thirties. Mm. Mm. Um, I was prepared to formulate ideas about the Chinese political system and what was happening in it at this moment, uh, I, had, I had nothing to lose. Mm. I had no reputation at the time. Uh, I was young uh, and it was a small field and I was uh, one of the few people in it. Um, as you get older, you are the prisoner of your past pronouncements <laughs> and you are the prisoner of uh, the reputation you've built up. Mm. And so you take less risks. Uh, but I think that w the way that I got at the ideas was f one principle to start with. The Chinese are human beings like the rest of us. They may have different methods of behavior in certain circumstances, but the basis of jealousy and t ambition and so on, they're all there. And as long as you assume that the Chinese are ordinary human beings like the rest of us, uh, then certain rules will apply. You know, the basic rule of politics, while there's death, there's hope. <laughs> um, and that applies in China as well as... Do you mean while there's death or while there's life? No, while there's death, there's hope. Oh, right. Because when someone dies, there's a post uh, opening for you. <laughs> I see, I see, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, that's why um, while there's a purge, there's hope. I mean, if, some, if someone X is purged, you, Y, think, oh, I'll get X's job. You don't mm. think, oh God, I'll be purged next. Mm. Um, so I think that uh, I treated the Chinese as if they were ordinary human beings. And I studied and I looked at the system. I saw how it developed. I read what Mao wrote. I read what other people wrote. And gradually you get the feel of it. Mm. It takes time. And I wouldn't say I'd I may have had one or two eureka moments. I'd have to reconstruct them now. But uh, basically, uh, it's sort of a lot of hard graft, and suddenly you think, Christ, yes. Mm. Well, Christ, yes, is perhaps a very good time <laughs> to end this fascinating interview. Thank you very much indeed. Alan, thank you so much. <laughs>